Dave, in order to really understand what reality is, the mind-body problem is one of the classic ways that we've begun to think about what, how reality is constructed. How, how, how do you see the mind-body problem? How, how would you structure it so we can begin to approach it? Well, we have bodies, we have minds. We have physical properties, we have mental properties. The mind-body problem is how do those relate? to each other? How are our thoughts and feelings connected to the mass of cells and neurons and processes that make up our body? Are there, is there only fundamentally one thing here? Are we fundamentally bodies and brains and the mind is derivative? Are we fundamentally minds and is the body derivative? Or are we fundamentally unions of bodies and minds with both of them equally fundamental? And if the latter, uh, do they interact? Do each, does each one work on their own? Is uh, causality one way or the other way or both ways? Yeah, are they separate realms here which have nothing to do with each other? I mean, it's obvious there are some connections and correlations between the two. You affect my brain, you affect my mind. You, you know, you, you cut out my eyes, yeah. I can no longer have conscious experiences of seeing. So there's obviously a connection, but is it just straight from the brain to the mind? Or can the mind actually affect the body? You know, that's, uh, that's, that's one of the big mysteries of philosophy. Well, let's start simply and look at the entities of the mind-body problem. We say body, we really in today's world mean brain. How would you define a brain? Brain is just this big lump of stuff inside our heads that seems to be intimately involved with our thinking and reasoning. Now, it's made up of neurons, little nerve cells, and it has a great gradation. I mean, we can find brains in, in earthworms that are little nodes of ganglia, yeah. or clumps of neurons that, uh, w there's a very vast uh, 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 spectrum of brains. And, and what do we, do, do, do all of these figure into the mind-body problem? Well, the mind-body problem really arises in the first instance with humans, because those are the ones that we know are conscious and have minds. Actually, I mean, I'd like to say, you know, my mind-body problem arises first with me. And with my mind, you know, I think you probably have a mind and other people, I can't be sure of that. I can be sure of mine. So my mind-body problem arises with me. Your mind-body problem arises with you. And collectively, our human mind-body problem arises with us. Now, dogs, is there a mind-body problem for dogs? Well, as long as they have minds. We think they do. We can't be sure they do because you can't observe a mind directly so how do you from the outside. How do you def we've defined brains, the spectrum of clumps of neurons that get bigger and bigger and ultimately fill our cranium. So how do we define minds? Minds are multifaceted. For me, the central aspect of the mind is consciousness, subjective, experiential consciousness, something that feels like something from the first person point of view. So does a dog have a first person point of view? Is there something it's like to be a dog? If there is, it has a mind. Does a rock you know, most people would say, no, a rock doesn't have a first-person point of view. Therefore, a rock doesn't have a mind. But in any case, that's the sine qua non for a mind for me. It's got to feel like something from the inside. I would think uh, there's the problem of other minds. I don't know whether you have a mind. But I would think, don't take this personally, that if you have a mind in the sense that you've defined it with this inner experience, that a dog has a mind too. That it, it, if, if I'm willing to admit that you do, I think the correlation that the dog has is, is about 100%. I find that plausible. I mean, some people say consciousness requires language. Without a language, you can't really be conscious. You can't really have beliefs. I don't see why consciousness requires yeah. language. You can hive off language, still have experience. Well, I think, I think you, even human beings who can lose their ability of consciousness don't lose their, their inner qualia, their inner experiences. Uh, uh, I, I think your consciousness is limited. You can't uh, express a lot of things and have beliefs and thoughts of certain kinds. But the, the experiencing, the, the uh, inner experiences are, are, I would think, the same. At least, again, if I believe you have it, I believe a dog has it. You know, I mean, people can affect their brains in pretty serious ways, through drinks and drugs and brain injury. It still seems like they have basic consciousness. You know, they can still see and feel. They can feel pain. That's a fundamental primitive yeah. kinds of consciousness. And I think probably a dog could feel pain. And they have that inner experience of it. Yeah, it feels like something. So if we then define mind in terms of this inner, inner experience, and we define brain in terms of, of clumps of neurons, certainly when they get uh, expressed in mammalian, mammalian brains, in our case, we know that it's at least correlated with inner experiences. 
Uh, how then can we then make the next step in defining brains to, to non-biological brains? Because, uh, you know, computer is called an electronic brain. Now, that's sort of a metaphorical word, but it is a, a sophisticated computer, a supercomputer, a quantum computer that ultimately may be built uh, uh, with more processes that, uh, than our brains will be able to, to, to have per second, maybe, maybe a trillion times more computations per second than our brain. That, is that a brain? Is that conscious? Well, I, th I think it's really a convention of language, whether we would call a computer a brain or not, not in the biological sense, maybe in some extended sense. The really interesting question, though, is not the question of is it a brain, but does it, would it support consciousness? Yeah. You know, would there be something it's like from the inside to be that computer? You know, when you turn it off at night, are you like winking off <laughs> somebody's mind? If you are, then that makes a really big difference to how we interact with computers. Certainly my, will increase the electricity bill. <laughs> exactly. My own view is that, uh, my own view is that at least, if not now, then eventually, there's no reasons why computers could not be, you know, fully conscious beings like you and me. Kind of strange and bizarre that silicon processes in a computer could somehow generate consciousness. But equally strange and bizarre that neurons in a brain do it. Neurons do it. I don't see why silicon chips shouldn't. Well, if that's the case, why are in current computers having some rudimentary consciousness, like a frog might or an earthworm? I'm not sure what the, how, how low you have to go on the biological scale to get the equivalent of today's supercomputers. Well, you know, I don't rule out there's some very primitive kind of consciousness that goes along even with primitive information processing. Nothing we'd call a person or a, you know, an intelligence maybe some primitive kind of feeling. Of course, as the information processing gets more and more complex, as it does in the brain, then we get more and more complex experience of the kind we normally call consciousness. So you know, maybe there's proto-consciousness deep down. Maybe even there's, you know, I don't rule out there could be proto-consciousness inside the processes in a computer. Crazy idea, but yeah, you know, we can't tell from the outside. If, metaphorically speaking, God, the omnipotent, the, metaphorically speaking, if God, an omniscient being, could tell you for sure that in principle, no matter how complex the computer will ever be, quantum computer, no matter how many processes per second, there will never be an internal experience in that non-biological entity, so that it will never be the case that it, it is something to feel like to be that computer. How then would your uh, 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 impression about consciousness change? I would then think that one would have to, just say God told me that computers couldn't have consciousness. I would then think, okay, there's something important about biology. It's not just organization. Right now, I think it's organization and information is what matters to consciousness. Could turn out that I'm wrong. If I was wrong about that, then I think what I'd decide is what really matters is the intrinsic nature of the matter. You've got to be made from the right kind of matter, and consciousness is really tied to certain kinds of matter in generating consciousness. Not just the patterns, but the matter itself. And that's okay, that's another alternative view. But I think that's where that would force me. But as of now, you see that if general organization of matter can either create consciousness or be correlated with consciousness, then it is entirely natural in your natural world consciousness being a part of it, for a computer to be conscious. Well, I think consciousness is something more than processes in the computer, but I think it's also something more than processes in the brain. The question is, what would correlate with it in the physical world? I think the best correlate we have of consciousness in the physical world is processes and patterns. And those processes and patterns can just as well be embedded, I think, in a computer as in a brain.